Today, we'll be covering a fascinating topic. But before we do that, how would you like to get a deeper understanding of history, impress your friends, and predict the future more accurately based on past events? If this sounds like something you might be into, then check out the brand new Captivating History Book Club by clicking the first link in the description. Let's get into the video. If anyone is worth the moniker terrible, it's Ivan. His life started terribly. His father's death followed his terrible twos, and his teens were dominated by some terrible trustees. But none of these incidents earned the first czar his nickname, which came from his terrifying tyranny. Let's explore the reign of Ivan IV of Russia. Ivan was the product of a scandalous relationship between the Grand Prince Vasily III and a young woman who, although from a noble family, had a relatively unimpressive lineage. After Vasily's first wife was unable to produce an heir, he bundled her off to a nunnery and married Yelena Glinskaya. By all account, Vasily was besotted with his new wife, much to the chagrin of his courtiers. He started dressing nicely to please her and even trimmed his beard. By medieval Russian standards, he was under the thumb, and the Russian nobles, called boyars, did not approve of Yelena despite her bearing an heir and a spare. Ivan, born in 1530, and his younger brother, Yuri. When Ivan was three, his father died of blood poisoning after he injured himself hunting, and Ivan was named the Grand Prince of Moscow. Ivan's mother ruled in his name for five years before dying suddenly, and some, including Ivan, believed she was poisoned. Ivan was a sickly child, and Yuri was born deaf, so the boyers saw the situation as an opportunity to seize the reins of power and struggled against each other rather than rule efficiently. Ivan was crowned Tsar of Russia in January 1547 at the age of 16. Despite suffering from personal loss and growing up in fear of the domineering boyers, he was determined to run the vast state he had inherited peacefully and initiated a period of reform. The next month, he married his true love, Anastasia Romanovna. At first, it seemed Ivan IV would be a strong and benevolent ruler. He reformed the church organized an advisory assembly called Zemsky Sabor, and updated the legal code. Ivan then reorganized the Russian administration, improved the army's working conditions, and appointed military commanders based on merit rather than lineage. The majority of Ivan's reforms were to limit the power of the hereditary aristocracy. This decision was probably a direct result of the boyer's actions during Ivan's childhood. Instead of promoting the interests of the hereditary estate holders, Ivan favored the service gentry. Service gentry were those who held lands as compensation for their service rather than their lineage. As such, the service gentry were dependent on the Tsar to keep their titles and land. For most of Ivan's reign, Russia was at war. He managed to annex the Khanate of Astrakhan in 1556 and secured the Volga River for Russia, rendering the trade route to the Caspian Sea safe for Russian trade. Ivan wanted to expand trade options with Europe and set his sights on expanding westward, declaring war on Livonia, modern-day Latvia and Estonia. Ivan and Anastasia had six children during this time. Only two survived until adulthood, Ivan and Fyodor. After 13 years of marriage, Anastasia died in 1560. Ivan was distraught, banging his head against the floor and smashing up his furniture. The seeds of paranoia that were sown during his childhood started to germinate. Not knowing the cause of his wife's death, Ivan suspected she had been poisoned. He assumed that the boyers had intended to poison him, and Anastasia had become the accidental victim of their treachery. Over the next four years, Ivan's misgivings grew. His war with Livonia was going badly, and he suspected several of his boyers of treason. Then, after the defection of one of his field commanders, Prince Andrei Kurbsky, to Poland-Lithuania in 1564, he announced that he intended to abdicate rather than be a victim of betrayal. However, the clergy led the Muscovites to implore Ivan to continue his rule, which he did under the condition he should be able to deal with any traitors as he saw fit. He then formed an Oprechnina, basically a territory that would be under his direct control and operate separately from the rest of the state. Ivan tortured and killed any boyar suspected of treason, which turned out to be quite a few before retreating to his Oprichnina. There, 
he was protected by hand-picked nobles and a bodyguard of between 1,000 and 6,000 men called the Oprichniki. Ivan cut himself off from the bureaucrats that ran the rest of the country and gave the Oprichniki complete impunity. The Oprichniki were free to dole out whatever punishments they saw fit to anyone they suspected of treason, regardless of proof. Their brutal methods including using men and women for target practice. The explanations for this drastic change in leadership style continue to be debated today. Most documents from this time were destroyed in a fire, so historians are free to speculate about the causes behind Ivan's actions. The prevailing theory centers on Ivan's power struggle with the hereditary nobility, who resented Ivan's reforms. Ivan may have been attempting to destabilize the political strength of the elite by centralizing power in the Oprisnina. But however principled his motives, this was the start of Ivan's reign of terror. His actions from this point on would obscure any previous success and cause him to go down in history as Ivan the Terrible. The Oprichnina only lasted from 1565 to 1572, but more than 3,000 members of the gentry were killed during this period. Many people were publicly and cruelly executed. In 1570, Ivan led his troops against the Russian city of Novgorod. Novgorod had historically been an independent city, which did not sit well with Ivan, who saw their individuality as treasonous. As the people of Novgorod were also vocal about the detrimental effect on trade that Ivan's wars had on the city, he decided that they should be punished. The attack on Novgorod cemented Ivan's reputation for cruelty and paranoia. His constant fear that people were turning against him allowed him to be used by many for their own gain. Ivan was convinced by Novgorod's treachery by a man called Peter Volnyets. Volnyets had been punished by the courts of Novgorod and had a score to settle with them. He convinced Ivan of a conspiracy to bring the territories of Novgorod under the rule of King Sigismund Augustus, Ivan's Polish and Lithuanian rival. Volnyets then told Ivan of the existence of a hidden letter that corroborated his story, which he later provided. While Ivan was glad that he finally had a concrete reason to attack Novgorod, some of his men were not so convinced. Because of general misgivings about attacking Novgorod, Ivan decided to keep his plans and army secret. He took his troops through the forest pathways rather than the usual routes and killed anyone they came into contact with to maintain the secrecy. Those killed included travelers, entire inhabitants of any towns they came across, and families in exile from Slava. Who were traveling to Moscow. Men, women, and children were massacred to keep the army's progress under wraps. Just before reaching Novgorod, Ivan ordered some of his troops to race ahead and seal off the city, ensuring no one got out. In January 1570, Ivan and his men arrived at Novgorod. Ivan immediately ordered all the monks, abbots, abbesses, and nuns from the surrounding area to be beaten to death. Their mangled bodies were then returned to their monasteries for burial. The next day, he entered Novgorod and was met by Archbishop Piman and his clergy in a religious procession. Ivan proclaimed the Archbishop to be a worshipper of evil and an enemy to the crown, but then had him turn back to the cathedral to celebrate Mass. Ivan was deep in prayer during Mass and later joined in eating with the Archbishop at his palace. It seemed Ivan's rage had subdued, but halfway through the meal, he ordered his soldiers to loot the palace and remove all its treasures. He then placed the archbishop and everyone from Novgorod who was in attendance under arrest. But this was not the end of the archbishop's humiliation. Piman was stripped of his robes, and the chaste man was married to a horse, before being sat upon it and taken to Moscow for sentencing. Ivan rounded up citizens, torturing them for information about the conspiracy, a conspiracy that had been concocted and was not true. Under torture, some citizens confessed to imaginary crimes or implicated others in the supposed plot. Torture methods included standing the victim in a cauldron of water under which a fire was lit. For a month, Ivan and his men killed the people of Novgorod. Men, women, and children were hurled into the frigid Volkov River with their hands and legs bound. Any that did surface were hacked with axes until they sank under the icy water. Around 30,000 people met their end this way their corpses being carried downstream and out of sight. In addition to drownings, Ivan personally dispatched several merchants by trapping them in a field and then charging at them on horseback and slaughtering them with a lance. 
Around a third of the population had been killed when Ivan finally finished with the carnage, although it's hard to know the true number of casualties. Ivan's volatile temper would backfire on him eventually. In 1581, he saw his pregnant daughter-in-law, Yelena Shurimateva, dressed in light clothing that he deemed inappropriate, beating her to the point that she later miscarried. His eldest son, Ivan, Yelena's husband, was understandably outraged at his father. The younger Ivan confronted his father and they argued. In a fit of rage, Ivan the Terrible swung his heavy scepter and hit his son. Whether the strike was an accident or not, Ivan instantly regretted his actions. As blood spurted from his son's head, Ivan tried to stem the bleeding, but it was to no avail. Ivan's eldest son and only viable heir died three days later. About three years later, Ivan the Terrible died, apparently of a stroke, during a game of chess. Due to the death of his eldest son, the empire was left to his weaker son, Theodore, who handed over any government affairs to his wife's brother and died childless just under 14 years later. Long after his death, Ivan's body was exhumed and examined. It seems his sickly nature may have been to blame for his extremely volatile temperament. Testing on Ivan's remains found high levels of mercury, which was used to treat syphilis at the time. The side effects of mercury poisoning include changes in temperament, irritability, and nervousness. Ivan lived a terrible life, from his upbringing to his brutal reign and murder of his beloved son. But his nickname has been lost in translation somewhat. It comes from the Russian Grozny, meaning inspiring awe or fear. While he did do some terrible things, so did many historical rulers, even ones who have gone down in history as great rather than terrible. It is easy to write Ivan off as a terrible leader who tortured his subjects. Still, we can't completely ignore the 13 years of his rule when he was peaceful, innovative, and in love. To learn more about Ivan the Terrible, check out our book, Ivan the Terrible a captivating guide to the first Tsar of Russia and his impact on Russian history. It's available as an ebook, paperback, and audiobook. Also, grab your free Mythology Bundle ebook while it's still available. All links are in the description. If you enjoyed the video, please hit the like button and subscribe for more videos like this.